Hi, I'm Miranda Wright, and this is day 47 of our 120-day Upper Room Prayer Campaign. And today we're going to pray for endurance through the assurance of the blessings of the resurrection to come for each and every one of us who believe because of the faith that has been granted us because of the testimony of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20, it says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all died, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ, the first fruits, Afterward, they that or crisis at his coming. Now, my friend, I have to explain to you the principle of first fruit because I have something that will encourage you today. I have something that will stir your faith and give you that steadfastness, that endurance that you've been so longing for. The Bible says he that endures till the end shall be saved. Paul said this is not a race for the swift. But this is a race of endurance. It's not those who run fast that win, but those who run till the end. So when you run, run to win, run with endurance. In this amazing passage in 1 Corinthians, we're told that Christ was the first fruits of the resurrection. Because you see the gospel message, it starts in Genesis and it ends in Revelation and it begins with the reality that man fell out of relationship with God in the garden because that when he sinned and rebelled against the will of God, he fell under the curse of death. Therefore did sin bring death into the world, but God so loved the world. That he wasn't willing to let us go. So he sent his only begotten son. That whomever might believe in him. In the words that he had to say. And in what he had to demonstrate. They might be saved. And not perish. But have everlasting life. And it is the promise of that everlasting life. That thing not seen yet hoped for. That will give us the endurance to live for eternity and not for the here and now. That we might make the right decisions for a better forever. And not make wrong decisions trying to build a better right now. Because that we are promised that there is coming a day when Jesus Christ shall return. He's going to come back and bust open that eastern sky. And all of those who believed in him, who walked in righteousness, obeying his will and his words out of love and faith in what he had to say and what he was offering, they're going to be raised up to meet him. And they're going to rule and reign with him in a beautiful and peaceful kingdom where there are no more tears, where all work and walk in righteousness, where things are finally right. How we long and desire for that day. My friend, I tell you that Jesus is coming back again. And from the beginning, this message was given to humanity. Live for a better resurrection. Live for a better forever. Make your decisions not based on what you can get out of the moment, but what you can get out of forever when you truly believe that he is coming back with an everlasting kingdom and you can have a place in it depending on the decisions that you make right here and now you will make better decisions. It will be so much easier to live with within the commitment of the marriage covenant of the Lamb of God. It's hard to live faithful for a groom that you've lost sight of the reality that he is coming for you. Jesus said that we are to live every day with the expectation that he could return at any moment. The return of Christ is as much a biblical reality and a part of the gospel as our salvation from hell, as the blood of Jesus, as the power of the Holy Spirit, as the curse of sin and death. My friend, we've got to believe the whole counsel of God's word. That is what having faith is. We've got to believe everything from the Garden of Eden, that sin brought the curse of death. That is the whole reason that Jesus 
Jesus came to redeem us from that curse and that he might bring us everlasting life. But there's a goal at hand. There's still the end of the story that we are reaching out to in faith and believing for. That the reason he redeemed us from the sin of that curse was so that we could be forever together with him in that new city, that new Jerusalem, that place where he will rule and reign and we will be at his side, his blessed bride. So my friend, I'm here to encourage you today of the reality of the return of Christ and give you endurance through the assurance that you will be resurrected with him. If you have faith in what he said and what he did and endure till the end. You see, I have to explain to you the principle of first fruits. In ancient biblical times, God had given a commandment to the Israelites that whenever a harvest came in, no matter what the harvest was, wheat harvest, barley harvest, olive harvest, fruits on your trees, eggs from your chickens, whatever it was, the first fruits that came in, the the first bit of harvest that began to ripen, that was holy and set apart unto the Lord. You had to give that back to God. You couldn't keep it for yourself. This was an act of faith, you see, because when a person needed that barley harvest to feed his family and survive on for the whole year until the next barley harvest, giving up that first evidence, that first fruit, that first little handful of barley that you might think we need this to eat and survive, giving that up to the Lord saying, here, I give you everything that I have, God. This is yours. I'm giving it to you in faith that you were the one who gave it to me in the first place. And if I have the faith to release it back to you, then you're going to give it back to me in greater measure on the end. I may have to wait a little longer to see it, but I believe in you. I believe in your goodness. And this is a declaration of faith that I am going to wait for the big harvest. This is the principle that we still hold to today in the concept of tithing. That the first 10% of what we make, we give unto the Lord in faith that he will supply our needs in greater measure for the rest of it. But in this same likeness was Christ given unto us. Because you see, Jesus came as that first fruit, the first evidence of the harvest. He lived among us. He walked in righteousness, led by the spirit of the living God, and he laid down his life. And on the third day, he rose again. He was resurrected. Because you see, one of the main purposes in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection was to show us that God's word is true and that he's going to do what he promised to do and that he will bring that harvest in the end, that there is a promise, a hope, a blessed assurance, something to look forward to, something to live and attain to, a reason to press forward, a reason to obey, a reason to trust in every word that he has to say because there's a resurrection coming. You see, believe it or not, the concept of the resurrection was understood from the very beginning. Many of the prophets of old talked about the day of the coming of the Lord. But it comes to a point where it's hard to have faith for that thing that's in the future, for that harvest that seems so far away. So was God willing to give us first fruits, the evidence that a harvest is coming. So I tell you, my friend, with all assurity that one of the main reasons that Christ died and was resurrected was to give us faith that we might be saved by faith, faith in him, faith for the resurrection, that we need to live in alignment with God's word and trust in him that we might be found worthy to take part in the resurrection because it will assuredly come. Because if he was able to raise Christ from the dead, then he is able to raise us also. We are not without hope. Therefore has hell lost its victory and death lost its sting. It's not such a bad thing anymore because we know that our Christ is coming and we will be raised with him into newness of life, made a new creature in Christ to rule with him death is not the end and when you have that assurance my friend that faith it's part of our christian faith that we've got to grab hold of and set our eyes and our hearts on and every day live with expectation that he could come at any moment and even for those who don't live to see it in their flesh but have been laid into the grave they will be raised again if they died in christ they will be raised to newness of life because there's a resurrection coming God raised Jesus from the dead to give us the evidence that he did it then and he can do it again. If he did it for him, he can do it for us. Jesus was the first fruits of the resurrection. 
You see that first fruit when it comes in, it's proof that the harvest is on its way, but we have to give it up in faith. We've got to give that back to God. Therefore was Jesus, though he had been resurrected, given back to the father. And just like those Israelites of old, after they had given up their first fruits back to God, did they have to wait in faith, believing that because God had given them the first fruit, would he bring a greater harvest in doing it again, bringing a multitude of fruit in. And so we do the same with Christ because we believe, we see that God was faithful enough to give us that first fruit. And though it had to be given back unto the Father, we look at it in faith, knowing that he is able to bring the end result, the final harvest, that resurrection. If he could resurrect Christ from the dead, surely he can resurrect you and me. Death is not the end, my friend. It is only the end of the temporary and the beginning of eternity. So I want to read you that passage again in 1 Corinthians fifteen twenty, when it says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man death came, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all died, but so in Christ all shall be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that or Christ's at his coming my friend he is coming back again and if we can set our eyes on things eternal it'll be easier to run for the prize the saints of old would sing those great old hymns blessed assurance he is our hope and our blessed assurance he is our peace and our strong tower that we run into and the righteous are saved he has taken away the sting of death hell and the grave because that we know it is not the end but only the beginning of what he has truly intended for us from the beginning he wants us to rule and reign with him forever in a heavenly kingdom with all authority power and dominion Minion. He has a plan for us in his kingdom, but we're only going to get there by faith. Faith in who he is and faith in what he did and faith in what it means for you and me. Because that he was resurrected from the dead, we have to believe that we will be also. Titus chapter 2 verse 11 says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust." We should live soberly, righteously, and godly. This is the purpose of grace. God has allowed his grace to be given to all men for the purpose of teaching us that we must deny all ungodliness. We must turn away from worldly lust, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking forward to that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority and let no man despise you for it. Do you understand that this is a huge part of the gospel message, my friend? When is the last time that you heard it? Because this gives you endurance. To be reminded of the assurance that he is coming back and that we need to live godly and righteously to be prepared for that. That God is looking for a holy people, a righteous people, a people zealous of good works, a people with a drive and an ambition, a bride who abides and is waiting for him at the well. God is coming and this is what he's looking for. And when we remind each other of it, it drives us to endure. That's why Paul told Titus to be sure to preach this regularly, to speak it, to exhort people, to rebuke when needed, to walk in authority and let no man despise you for delivering this message. Because this is the gospel of Jesus Christ and the preaching of it is power. So I'm here to remind you today, my friends, before we begin to pray, to have faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Remember that our God loved us enough to die for us, but the true power of our gospel is that he didn't stay dead. He was resurrected by the power of the Holy Spirit, and that same spirit lives inside of us, and we're going to be resurrected one day into newness of life to rule at his side and the things that we do now will bear record and bear weight on eternity 
My friend, I believe in the resurrection. And if this life is but a job interview for my placement in eternity, I'm going to give it my all. I'm going to give it my best. I'm going to do like Paul said, and I'm going to run this race to win it. So much in this world is designed to make you focused on the here and the now, on what you can get out of the moment, on the attention, on the money, on the prestige, on the platform, on the property, on what you can build here and now. But my friend, it's all temporary. Jesus was not impressed by any of it because he said it's all going to burn in the end. I'm telling you, my friend, we've got to set our eyes on things eternal again, and it will drive a people of purity, of passion, of power, and of faith because it's part of the faith. It's part of the gospel of Jesus. Christ. We've got to believe this with all of our heart again, and it will cause us to be the true church again, because it will drive us to make decisions based on eternity and not based on the moment. Because when you're driven to make decisions based on the moment, you will always make selfish decisions. But when you're driven to make decisions based on eternity, you will always make selfless decisions decisions you will make decisions that will benefit the next generation when you regain your faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of the dead that will meet him it takes away your fear of the here and the now it takes away your fear of death that you can say to live is Christ and to die is gain whatever you want me to do Lord I will do it for the glory of your name because I'm not living for here and now I'm living for there and then because I believe you're coming back again you see the story of the Tishbite woman in the Old Testament when God had promised her this child because that she had helped the prophet Elijah And God gave her this child, for she had been barren before, but by divine means the Lord gave her and her husband this child. And then when the child had grown, he was out in the field with his father, and he became weary. And the sun beat down upon him, and the child fell ill and died working with his father in the field. And I always think about ministry in this aspect. Because I've seen a many a child of God grow weary and seem to fall dead spiritually. But God wasn't through yet. Because when the child was placed in his mother's arms, she began to pray. She did not doubt. She did not give up. She did not turn back or throw away her promise, but she had faith. She had endurance through the assurance that if God had given her this, this promise, he was going to do what he had said he would do, even if he had to raise this child from the dead to do it. She had faith for the resurrection. Therefore, was she able to say, even as she held that dead promise in her arms, it is well. And with all that was within her, she pressed out towards God and she ran with all of her might to the man of God but even while she was approaching him and they called out is it well with you and your husband and the child she replied it is well because she had faith for the resurrection And God raised that child from the dead. We see it in Abraham when he was willing to lay Isaac down on the altar, his only son. And without wavering, know that if God has given me a promise, he will make it good even if he has to raise this child from the dead to do it. My friend, we've got to be willing to lay everything down for God having faith faith that he's going to give us more in the resurrection. God, not my will, but thy will be done. I lay down my life right now, having faith that you will give me a better one in the resurrection. This is why Jesus said, if you're willing to lose your life, you will save it. But if you try to keep that life that you've got now, you're going to lose it in the end. Because what you have now that you're trying to hold on to, it will all be counted ash in the end. But if you're willing to lay it all down now and live for Christ, when he raises you up again and brings you back in the end, he will give you more than you ever gave up now, my friend. I assure you of it. Have endurance through the assurance of the resurrection to come. One of the greatest examples of this, I think, is Job. We all know the story of Job and and all the horror that he went through. It is a story synonymous with misfortune and hardship and heartache and heartbreak. But my friend, I want to give you a different perspective on Job. Job is actually one of the oldest books, if not the oldest book in the Bible as far as when it was penned. 
Of course, we know chronologically in the record, Genesis and so forth goes before it. But as far as when it was written, Job is thought to be the oldest or among the oldest. It was written by Moses when Moses wrote the accounts of Genesis and Exodus and so forth. We know that Job lived sometime between the time of creation and Moses because Moses penned the story. We don't know exactly where, but I'm giving you a time frame of how old this story is so that you can see the power from the very beginning and having faith in that blessed assurance and how it will bring you an unfailing endurance in the midst of any trial and hardship. It will give you that stability that you've been praying for when you get a grasp on the reality of the resurrection when you put your faith in it it will set your walk in a whole new direction my friend let me tell you about job Job lost everything. All of his children were killed. His property was destroyed. His livestock was destroyed. His home was destroyed. He became sick and ill. His whole body racked with pain and blisters. His own wife turned against him. All of his friends came to accuse him and to curse him. This man sat there in a place of absolute desperation. The enemy unleashing everything that he could against him. Trying to get him to curse God. To give up on God. And to turn away. And we see Job sit in faith. And in this life, he never got to see why he had to suffer. But because he suffered, he got to see God. And that was enough. But for us, it is a record in the power of faith and how an assurance of the resurrection can cause you to have endurance through all trial and tribulation. Because I tell you, my friend, that even though we don't think of him in this manner, Job was the first prophetic book ever written in the Bible. We don't think of Job as a prophet, but I assure you that he was. In Job 19 23 we read oh that my words were now written oh that they were penned in a book he was prophesying and didn't even realize it saying oh if the words that i'm speaking would be recorded in a book for all of history to read well i can tell you job it was and we're reading it now he continues to say that they were graven with an iron pen and led in the rock forever for I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day, the last day upon the earth. He's talking about God, that the Lord will stand on the earth in the last day. He is prophesying the return. And then Job says this astonishing thing. He says, and though after my skin, worms have destroyed this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. He is saying that though I have been dead for many hundreds and thousands of years and worms have completely destroyed all of my body and my skin and there is nothing physically left of me, yet will I stand in my flesh before God. He is speaking of a resurrection. Whom I shall see for myself, he says. I will stand before God, who I shall see for myself. And mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. He's saying, I'm going to see him. I'm not going to hear about it from somebody else. And I'm not even talking about being a spiritual being. But I am going to be raised again into newness of life. That old corruptible will put on incorruption. I will be given a glorified body. And I am going to stand before the Lord God Almighty. I am going to make it to the resurrection. And because I believe in the resurrection, I'm not going to do anything right now to endanger my place in it. So no matter what hell comes against me, no matter that my wife is telling me to just curse God and die, to give up on my faith, no matter that my friends are trying to tell me that God has hated me and abandoned me, I'm not going to dare say anything against my king. Because no matter what I lose in this life, no matter what suffering I have to endure, None of it is worth giving up my place in eternity because I believe in the resurrection of my Lord and I'm going to stand before him and be found worthy. So I will endure. This is the message of Job. In Job 14 verse 11, he says, Oh, that thou wouldst hide me in the grave, that thou wouldst keep me secret until thy wrath be passed, that thou wouldst appoint me a set time. And remember me, if a man die, shall he not live again? All the days of my appointed time, 
I will wait till my change come. What change is he talking about? It's the change that's spoken of by the spirit of the living God in the New Testament when it says, and they shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye and the corruptible shall put on incorruption and they will rise to meet him in the clouds. He is talking about the resurrection of the dead. He is saying, I may die, but I will wait until my appointed time when I am changed. He says, thou shalt call and I will answer thee. Job, was not willing to compromise or curse God and die. He was not willing to sin, to walk out of his righteousness. Job was not a poem or a story. In the book of Ezekiel, God himself says that Job was a real man and a very righteous man. Job stayed in right standing with God at all costs because he wasn't living for right now, because it didn't matter that he lost all his material possessions. It didn't matter that everybody turned against him. It didn't matter that he had nothing left in this life to live for because he wasn't living for this life. He was enduring till the end for his Lord because he believed in the resurrection. And my friend, it can do the same for you if you will put your faith in it. It's part of the reason Jesus died and was resurrected to give us that example, that first fruits, that we might have faith for the harvest to come. My friend, it is the spirit of the living God that raised Christ from the dead. And that same spirit is given unto us to prepare us, to make us holy, to lead, guide, and direct us, to sanctify us, to move us into right standing with God if we will obey to the leading of it, to prepare us to be a pure and spotless bride ready for Christ at his coming, that we might rule and reign with him, that everything that we were willing to lay down and to give up and to sacrifice in this life might be given back to us many times full in the one to come. We've got to have faith again in the return of Jesus and the resurrection. In 2 Corinthians 4 verse 13, it says, we having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believe and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. In other words, if you really believe it in your heart, you need to start speaking it. You need to start professing it. You need to start confessing it. You need to start preaching it and reminding others of it because it will stir faith in you and it will stir faith in them. Let the seed that has been planted in you bear fruit through you that it might be planted in someone else that they might have the endurance because it's not a race to the swift. It is a race of endurance. Those who endure till the end shall be saved. The passage continues to say, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you for all things are for your sakes. Those that we minister to, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many rebound unto the glory of God. For which cause we faint not, we're not giving up, we're not quitting, we will have endurance. But though our outward man may perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Even though we may be getting older, even though we may be getting weaker, even though we may be getting frailer in the physical frame, is our spirit man being strengthened. We've got to endure to continue to grow that spirit man because it doesn't matter that this physical body is slowly dying. If the spirit is ever coming more, more and more to life because that is what is being prepared for eternity if you have faith in the resurrection it will cause you to continually progress and march on but though our outward man perish yet the inward man is renewed day by day for our light affliction which is but for a moment my friend the man that is writing this has faced imprisonment torture beatings lashings slanderings, persecutions, shipwrecks, hunger, thirst, courts, trials, tribulations. And he says, but for our light affliction, he counts it all a light affliction in the scope of what he has faith to attain in the resurrection. He says, this is a light affliction. It is but for a moment, but it worketh for us a far more exceeding and internal weight in glory. It is worth enduring because it is building the rewards of eternity that are going to be paid out in the end, my 
friend get a grasp on eternity, on the resurrection. Lord, we come before you now and we thank you. God, we thank you that you were kind and good enough to give us that blessed hope, that assurance, that faith that we can rest in Jesus that we believe in our heart and we confess with our mouth that you raised him from the dead, that it is not too hard for you. And if you did it for him, you will do it for us because that you said you would. We believe by faith faith and we live for that day. We're not going to live for right now anymore. We're not going to make our decisions based on the next five years of our life. We're going to make our decisions based on eternity with Christ. We're going to work for a better forever and not just for the best right now. This is not my best day ever. My best day is going to be the day that I stand before my Lord God and King and worship him in the resurrection. And when I see all of my friends and loved ones come to meet me and we all glorify God together and we are given our rewards and we are positioned for eternity in that which you have called us to and tested us through and found us faithful in that the small things that we were faithful in that you will make us ruler over in greater measure and the eternal things of the kingdom of God God we give you praise and we give you glory for the trials of great reward that we go through God I thank you for the hardships that I've endured. I thank you for the opportunities that I've had to store up treasures in heaven. Lord, not on earth where moth and rust destroy. It doesn't matter that I've given up home and health and heartache and position and pomp and money and recognition in this life, God, because it is all gaining for me a greater weight of glory in eternity where it counts. God, I want to have the best story when I stand before you because there is coming a day when every man, sinner or saint, will stand before God and give an account for their lives, for all that was done and all that was not. And when our stories are laid out and told, I want to have the best story possible. So God, I'm going to make my decisions based on forever. Jesus, we thank you that you were willing to be the first fruits, that we might be stirred to faith for the harvest to come, for the resurrection. God, I thank you that you made a way for us to partake in that resurrection. Jesus, I believe that you are who you say you are and that you are coming back and that you can come back at any time that you want. And I'm going to live every day preparing for that. God, I pray that the blinders would fall off of the people, the lies of materialism that you said are thorns, the deceitfulness of riches and the cares of this world that choke out the fruitfulness of a once fruitful tree that caused people not to endure because they have not their sights set on eternity. So they turn their sights towards me, me, me what I can get right here and right now and it chokes out their fruitfulness because it chokes out their selflessness and it makes them selfish and it makes them waste their works and their times on what they can get out of it oh God but on that fateful day when they stand before you with nothing to show but a terrible story and ashes in their hands because everything that they built in this world will have burnt up and the only thing we're going to be able to truly say when we stand before you that will bear any weight was that we heard you we believed you and we obeyed and these are the souls that were saved because of it Lord and if we don't have that to show we don't have anything at all God I thank you that you have shown us the way that you have proven your words true and I believe them by faith faith and they will cause me to press through to get to you. I thank you that you give me endurance through the assurance of the resurrection because that you raised Christ from the dead though we had to commend him back into your hands. I stand in faith that he was merely the first fruit of a greater promise to come that there still is a resurrection of the dead and all of my loved ones who have gone on before and even me myself, if I don't make it to the day of the Lord, will be raised up into newness of life. We will be given a glorified body and brought before our Christ. And we will be rewarded for our works according to the word of the Lord God Almighty. And because I have believed completely the word of God, the gospel, the good news, the full counsel, 
of the words of Jesus Christ. I will abide and be found a pure and spotless bride at all costs. I have laid down my life because there is nothing in this present time that can compare to the glory that shall be revealed unto us at the resurrection, at the return of Jesus Christ, when all the dead are raised and we are given new life. My friend, have faith for the resurrection again, and it will bring your spirit to life. It will drive you. It will empower you. It will encourage you. It will refocus you. It will direct you. It will correct you. It will change your point of view. It's an important part of the gospel, my friends. We need to believe it and be willing to speak it once again because there's a whole new generation who needs to hear it and be empowered by it. So thank God for it and go out today and tell somebody about the resurrection. God raised our Jesus from the dead and one day he's coming back to do it again. Only this time it can be you if you only believe.